of those latest deficit numbers. And then conferees for the House and the Senate are meeting over whether or not to extend the payroll tax holiday for a year. That's another debate. Look for our coverage on cspan.org. Thanks for watching. House will be here. The chair lays before our House a communication from the Speaker. The Speaker's Rooms, Washington, D.C., February 1, 2012. I hereby appoint the Honorable Chip Cravath to act as Speaker Pro Temporary on this day. Signed, John A. Boehner, Speaker of the House of Representatives. Pursuant to the order of the House of January 17, 2012, the Chair will now recognize members from lists submitted by the majority and minority leaders for morning hour debate. The chair will alternate recognition between the two parties, with each party limited to one hour, and each member other than the majority and minority leaders and the minority whip limited to five minutes each. But in no event shall the debate continue beyond 11.50 a.m. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Poe, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We hear about religious persecution throughout the third world, but there is an anti-religious movement right here in the United States. The Catholic Church is being persecuted by this government. Our great country was founded on the principle of religious liberty. This right is in the First Amendment, and the provisions of the First Amendment are listed first because they are the most important. Yet the administration is chipping away at this cornerstone of our society by violating the religious liberty of those who hold fast to certain positions of their faith, in particular those of the Catholic Church. The Department of Health and Human Services recently announced that religious organizations will be forced to provide their employees with medical insurance that covers free contraceptives and sterilization. While houses of worship are exempt, religious affiliated organizations such as hospitals, universities, and charities are mandated to comply with this government edict. This goes against the basic tenets of the Catholic religion as well as other faiths, Christian and non-Christian. The administration believes that it's enough to give religious organizations one year's notice to comply with this government oppression. But there will never be enough time for the church to change its core principles. Timothy Dolan, president of the United States Council of Catholic Bishops and New York Archbishop, said it best, quote, In effect, the president is saying we have a year to figure out how to violate our consciences. Mr. Speaker, religious principles are not negotiable. They are to, not to be subject to bullying by any government, especially ours. No government has the legal or moral right to target any religion and make them violate their religious conscience. The administration is violating two provisions of the First Amendment, the free exercise of religion clause and the establishment of religion clause. The government is prohibiting the free exercise of religion because it is punishing Catholics for exercising their religious beliefs. Government is also violating the Establishment Clause by establishing a government religion, statism, because government is establishing its own moral standard that must be complied with or else. Regardless of where Americans stand on the issues of contraception, sterilization, or the abortion pill, it should be alarming for those who believe the government should not punish religions or substitute a religious doctrine for citizens. The government should stay out of the business of persecuting religions. This recent anti-religious mandate is completely unacceptable, but it is only one example in a long line of new government actions that disregard freedom of consciousness and religious liberty. This comes on the heels of the administration's denial of a grant to the United States Council of Catholic Bishops to aid victims of human trafficking. Not only have they been award awarded this grant in the past, but their application has received the highest quality score. Mr. Speaker, this money is used to help victims from the scourge of human slavery. But the church was denied this grant because their religious convictions do not provide contraceptives or refer women to abortions. Apparently, under this administration, in order to aid victims, it is necessary for religious groups to violate their religious convictions. These are only two of the most recent assaults by government, our government, on religious liberty and conscience. As soon as this administration came into office, a proposal was submitted to rescind 
conscience regula regulations for medical professionals. Protections for medical professionals who would not violate their conscience by dis distributing emergency contraceptives was rescinded. This was just a glimpse of what was to come in deliberate disregard for the First Amendment. This administration's attack on religious liberty is a strike at the core principles of our nation. Government is putting basic freedoms in jeopardy and bruising the U.S. Constitution. No government should force its citizens to violate their religious beliefs. Who would have thought that this nation, founded on religious liberty, would now be engaged in religious persecution against certain citizens and against certain churches? This ought not to meet, ought not to be, but that's just the way it is. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Americans know that Congress is broken, paralyzed by hyperpartisanship, fierce ideology, and unwillingness to respond to widely understood problems with broadly supported solutions. Why, at a time of growth and increasing diversity in America, does Congress not represent that change? Well, part of the answer is that's not how we're elected. Increasingly, we come from districts that are not just red or blue, but the colors are brighter, the divisions deeper. How can this be? Well, the answer is to be found in hallways and back rooms and state capitals all across America right now. Because after the census every 10 years, the great rebalancing occurs to adjust legislative districts to changes in populations. Some states will win or lose congressional seats, Every district in the 43 states that have multi-member districts will see some adjustment to balance out changes in growth. But not all voters are equal. Some are more, some are less inclined to support the party in power or support a particular incumbent. Now, one thing that politicians can all agree upon is that their district should be safer their party should be favored. The process of redistricting has been refined to an, a high art with the computer, very sophisticated survey research, uh, a treasure trove of data on voter behavior. In short, the politicians are hard at work picking their voters that will, in a way that will make it harder for voters over the next 10 years to pick their politicians. Now, Exhibit A uh, is a grotesque district that has been created in the state of North Carolina, uh, District 4, currently represented by our colleague, uh, Congressman David Price, that looks like somebody has just taken an egg and thrown it at the blackboard. But this effort where a 50-50 state with actually that went for Obama that has a Democratic senator, a Democratic governor, and a 7-6 advantage for Democrats in Congress now has been uh, at work with the Republicans in their legislature to try and turn it into a 10-3 advantage for Republicans going forward after the next election. But I could have taken an example in Illinois where there are Democrats are sort of reverse engineering those districts to democratic advantages. There is a bright spot for years, and that has been Iowa, where the process has been driven by an independent agency that draws districts without partisan log rolling and simply is referred to the legislature for an up or down vote. This year, all four districts in Iowa are competitive. One even features two incumbent senior members of Congress that are running against each other. There are other bright spots in California, Arizona, where voters have determined that there will be independent commissions. There are even some hope in Florida, where there are more constraints on the politicians and the redistricting. But make no mistake, it's not just one party losing when another party takes unfair advantage. In truth, 
everybody loses. There's less representative behavior in Congress. We have districts utterly without integrity. Um, it's hard to represent people. It's hard for people to understand who's representing them. And it shatters local interests. Well, most damaging, I think, is it just reveals a naked power grab that further undermines people's confidence in the political process. Well, we shouldn't have to wait decades for reform at the state level. And as we saw in Arizona, where Governor Brewer tried to fire the head of the Independent Redistricting Commission because the commission produced some districts that were fair and competitive, not tilted partisan, that these reforms can actually be sabotaged. I'm proposing H.R. 3846 to establish a national independent redistricting commission headed by states people, if you will, people who are appointed by legislative leadership like retired judges or former presidents, people who would oversee a professional agency like they have in Iowa to make sure that we have national uniform standards that are fair, maybe even some competitive districts in there, and stop the political log roll to prepare a national set of maps that would be subjected to an up or down vote by Congress. A lot of this stuff seems beyond our control in the political process. This is something we could do to make it better 10 years from now. I urge my colleagues to look at House Bill 3846. Thank you, and I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Nevada, Mr. Heck, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to honor a great Nevadan, Chester A. Chet Folk. Chet was a member of the greatest generation, born on July 19, 1922, and God called him home on December 31, 2011. Chet grew up in Quakertown, Pennsylvania, during the Great Depression of the 1930s. The hard times forced him to leave school after the 10th grade and to work in an aircraft plant near Philadelphia before the United States became involved in World War II. He enlisted in the United States Marine Corps in September of 1943 and attended recruit training at Paris Island, South Carolina, and advanced training at Camp Pendleton, California, and Camp Tarawa, Hawaii, in preparation for one of the war's toughest battles, Iwo Jima. As a demolition expert with Company C of the 5th Engineering Battalion, Chet fought on the front lines for 36 days. It was an awful battle, the way we got slaughtered, he said during a 2006 interview. Some days you'd make it 100, 200 yards, some days 500 yards. Chet was at Mount Suribachi when the first U.S. flag went up. I was standing there, looking up when that flag went up, and tears ran down my face, he said in another interview. I was just so happy to see that flag that I knew they were not going to push us off or do away with us. I felt so happy. When the war ended, he was sent to Japan for seven months of occupational duty before returning to the United States, where he received his discharge from the Marine Corps in May of 1946 as a corporal. He became a Nevadan when he moved to Las Vegas in 1972. In 1986, Chet helped found the Greater Nevada Detachment No. 186 of the Marine Corps League, where he served as commandant from 1992 to 1995, and then as chaplain for several years thereafter. He was greatly admired by members of the Marine Corps League for his bravery at Iwo Jima and his involvement in the Marine Corps League. Mr. Folk is survived by his wife of 29 years, Martha, his daughter, Mary, her husband, Ed, three stepsons, David, William, and Jeffrey, and several nieces and nephews. He will be greatly missed by all. Semper Fi. The gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Rangel, for five minutes. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I came to this uh, empty chamber to discuss uh, the issues of a uh, job and um, and also the unemployment compensation extension as well as taxes. But as I neared the uh, well, I heard one of our esteemed members 
condemning the president for persecuting uh, religion in a very broad and general way, and then later more specifically in talking about the Roman Catholic Church. And it would seem to me that uh, in a place like the United States of America, which was actually formed on the basis of freedom of religion, there's such a, a, a serious accusation against the president of these United States should not be to an empty chamber. Uh, this is uh, such a serious allegation that it would seem to me that it requires and demands a bipartisan view to see exactly what the church's or religious leaders' complaints are. Because I have one too. And that is at a time where this country is facing fiscal as well as moral obligation to the most vulnerable people among us, I see the battle between the have and the have-nots, the 1% and the 99%. I hear the disputes as to whether or not the capitalistic system is fair. But I always took the position that the capitalistic system is an invitation of how Americans and others can invest and make money. And the question of compassion, the question of taking care of your own, the question of uh, illness and jobs and the social issues of today, that it was the Congress that had the responsibility to deal with that rather than to be condemning on those monies who seek uh, to get returns on their investments. Having said that, let's take a look and to see what issues are biblical, what issues are in the Mormon faith, the Muslim faith, the, the Buddhist faith, the Jewish faith, Protestant and Catholic. It seems to me that throughout every one of these texts, there are things that say that we have a responsibility as human beings and God-fearing people uh, to protect the vulnerable. It's abundantly clear, even the stories about the Good Samaritan. It's almost a mandate when someone is sick that we have a responsibility to, to assist them. And certainly when we talk about uh, Jesus Christ uh, in Matthews, where these wealthy people are attempting to get into heaven, and they tell Jesus that when they, when he was, when the, Jesus tells them he was hungry, thirsty, unclothed, in jail, and that he didn't, that they didn't do anything to assist them, and they said that they don't remember Jesus ever coming asking for anything. And then, of course, the international, world famous biblical expression is that it wasn't how you treated Jesus, the Son of God but it was how you treated the lesser of our brothers and sisters. And I think everyone would agree, whether you want to accuse the president of being the food stamp president or saying he wants to bring socialism to the United States, all of that rhetoric doesn't hide the fact that the poorest of the poor now are suffering more than the people that caused this fiscal crisis. And that if we're going to, to do something about the deficit, we just can't say we've got to cut spending, especially when that spending is exactly the people that the spiritual leaders have made vows to protect. Oh, we don't call it the sick and the disabled and the uneducated, uh, but we do call it Medicaid. We do call it Medicare. We do call it Social Security. We do call it education, and we do call it the ability to get a job so that a person can have not only income to have his family be able to have the dignity and respect it deserves, but also we have to recognize that from an economic point of view, it is the people that are in the middle class that are slipping into poverty that makes the difference. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield back the balance of my time, and I hope that 
people will give serious thought to the accusation. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Fitzpatrick, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to honor the Girl Scouts of the USA, which will be celebrating its 100th anniversary on March 12, 2012. For 100 years, the Girl Scouts have fostered an environment that has created generations of women with sound character and strong leadership skills. Founded by Juliette Lowe in Savannah, Georgia, the first troop consisted of just 18 Girl Scouts. Today, there are more than 3.7 million Girl Scouts and more than 100 councils across our nation. Since its start, more than 50 million women have been a part of this extraordinary organization. The Girl Scouts of America teaches young women the importance of leadership and of community service. This past Sunday, I proudly participated in Troop 21292's Girl Scout Gold Award Ceremony, honoring seven young women from Bucks County, Pennsylvania. It pleases me to recognize these Girl Scouts for their exceptional accomplishment. Christine DiPiero, Catherine Silvernell, Charlotte Treble, Emily Krayek, Emily Nowalinski, Kimberly Wadsnanowski, and Margaret Zellin. These young ladies exemplify courage, confidence, and character, and have made the world a better place, which has been the mission of the Girl Scouts of the USA for 100 years. Mr. Speaker, on March 16, 1950, the United, the United States Congress chartered the Girl Scouts of the USA, and today, as a member of the United States Congress representing Pennsylvania's 8th District, it's my privilege to congratulate the Girl Scouts of the USA as they commemorate 100 years of building girls of courage, confidence, and character who have truly made the world a better place. Best wishes for success in the next 100 years. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Lipinski, for five minutes. Mr. Speaker, as a proud graduate of St. Zamfrosa Grammar School and St. Ignatius College Prep, and as a strong supporter of Catholic education, I have again this year introduced a resolution in honor of Catholic Schools Week to highlight the contributions Catholic schools make, not only to the students who attend them, but to our entire nation. Since 1974, the National Catholic Education Association the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops have provided leadership in planning and organizing Catholic Schools Week. This year it is celebrated from January 29th through February 5th. The theme, Faith Academic Service, celebrates the broad educational experience Catholic school students receive. Catholic school students are not only focused on academic excellence, but also on enriching the spiritual character and moral development of young Americans. America's Catholic schools produce graduates with the skills and integrity needed by our businesses, governments, and communities, emphasizing a well-rounded education and instilling the values of giving back to the community and helping others. Nearly every Catholic school has a community service program, and their students volunteer half a million hours every year to their parishes and communities. My own decision to pursue a career in teaching and then in public service was fostered in part by the dedicated teachers throughout my years in Catholic schools. Today, over two million elementary and secondary students are enrolled in nearly 7,000 Catholic schools where these students typically excel. They surpass their peers in math, science, reading, history, and geography in the NAEP test. The graduation rate for Catholic high school students is 99 percent, and 85 percent of graduates of these schools attend a four-year college. As we continually, continue to hear disturbing reports about our national test scores, these statistics are truly remarkable and should be commended. Notably, the success of Catholic schools does not depend on selectivity. These academic achievements are realized by students from all walks of life. Catholic schools accept nine out of every 10 students who apply and are highly effective in providing a quality education 
to students from every socioeconomic group, especially disadvantaged youth in underserved urban communities. Over the past 30 years, the percentage of minority students enrolled in Catholic schools has more than doubled, and today they constitute almost one-third of all Catholic school students. In times of economic hardship, Catholic schools provide an affordable alternative to other forms of private education. But in addition to producing well-rounded students, Catholic schools save taxpayers billions of dollars each year by lowering the number of students in already overburdened public schools. It is estimated that taxpayers save over $1 billion from students attending Catholic schools in the Chicago area alone, and approximately $20 billion nationwide. The importance of these savings is undeniable as we in Congress and lawmakers across the country struggle with deficits. I was born and raised and I live in the Chicago Archdiocese, home to one of the most successful Catholic school systems in the nation. In my parish at St. John of the Cross has one of the best schools in the Archdiocese. Right next door, the Joliet Diocese also has a thriving Catholic school system. The focus of this week's Catholic Schools Week, Faith Academic Service, reflects my own Catholic education. The knowledge, discipline, desire to serve, and love of learning it instilled in me enabled me to earn my doctorate and become a teacher before being elected to Congress. In recognizing Catholic Schools Week, we pay a special tribute to dedicated teachers and administrators who sacrifice so much, in most cases, working for less than they could earn elsewhere. I have many fond memories of my teachers, including many nuns, who taught me the value of faith, learning, and service. Throughout the United States, millions of others have similar memories of dedicated sisters, priests, and lay students who gave their hearts and souls to their students. This week, I had the honor of celebrating Catholic Schools Week at a number of schools, including St. Andrew's School in Romeoville, Everest Academy in Lamont, St. Michael's School in Orland Park, Cardinal Joseph Bernadine School in Orland Hills, and my alma mater, St. Semperosa in Chicago. I also joined St. Lyons in Oak Lawn, celebrating not only Catholic Schools Week, but the school's prestigious Blue Ribbon Award. Mr. Speaker, I ask my colleagues to join me in supporting the outstanding education Catholic schools provide to Americans across the country as we celebrate Catholic Schools Week. And I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Speer, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I ask unanimous consent to address the House for five minutes and revise and extend my remarks. Mr. Speaker, today uh, I rise quite saddened by the news that the Susan G. Komen Race for the Cure has made a political decision. A fine nonprofit that I have been associated with for years. I've run in the Susan G. Komen Race for the Cure. I've walked in the Race for the Cure. I have been the MC of a number of events locally that they have held. So I have been a big booster of the Susan G. Komen organization, but not anymore. Their announcement yesterday that they are no longer going to fund any organization that is being investigated by a federal, state, or local uh, body means that Planned Parenthood is no longer going to receive $600,000 a year. Now, ironically, yesterday, the Komen organization also announced, and with great concern in a statement, that the dismal rate of breast cancer screening with women who do not have insurance is something like 38.2 percent. Last year, the Planned Parenthood organization was responsible for over 700,000 700, breast cancer screenings for women who are poor, for women who don't have insurance, uh, for women who seek to get the health care they get through Planned Parenthood. So over the last five years, there have been four million breast cancer screenings by Planned Parenthood. Komen has funded about 170,000 of them through Planned Parenthood. 
So what does this mean? Well, I guess it means that so Susan G. Komen has decided to become a 501c4 because no longer do they want to be providing nonprofits. They want to become a political advocacy group. Last time I checked, we were all presumed innocent until proven guilty. And we look to investigations in the federal judicial branch. We look to investigations by the U.S. attorney or the district attorney. Far be it for us to rely on the House of Representatives holding a hearing as being emblematic of justice, because oftentimes it's a political sandbox. Now, this ostensible investigation is one that has been called on by Mr. Stearns, who is the subcommittee chair of Energy and Commerce on Oversight. The hearing has never been held. So why would Susan G. Komen take the remarkable step of saying they are no longer going to fund Planned Parenthood. I suppose when we review NIH and bring them under some investigation that they will stop funding NIH to the tune of a million dollars. Or I suppose that when we have a pharmaceutical company that we bring to the Hill to ask them questions about a particular activity that they will stop accepting sponsor money from that particular pharmaceutical company. All of you across this country that feel that Susan G. Komen should stick to what it knows, and that is breast cancer research and breast cancer screening and support and promote those activities by organizations that do the research and do the screening, I ask you to call them at 1-877-465-6636 and tell them that you want them to stick to what they know. Let's not make this a race to the political bottom. I yield back. The gentlewoman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Lee, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As the uh, founder of the Congressional Out of Poverty Caucus, I rise today to continue talking about the tide of poverty sweeping, sweeping across this country. Americans who are struggling to find work cannot wait. Americans whose homes are underwater cannot wait. And the nearly 50 million Americans who are living in poverty cannot wait. We must act and we must act now to extend vital unemployment benefits and the temporary payroll tax reduction while our economy continues to recover. We should be coming together now to enact bold programs and policies that provide equal opportunity and equal access for every single American, no matter their race, no matter their employment status, and no matter their humble beginnings. Instead, Mr. Speaker, unfortunately, this Tea Party-led Congress continues to do nothing but distract from the real issues and waste the American people's time. The Republican caucus failed to pass a single jobs bill last year, and by the looks of this week's calendar, it looks like they might be committed to doing more of the same. This nation cannot, cannot afford any more of this do-nothing Tea Party Republican House. Instead of passing a jobs bill, Republicans in the House today are attacking, are attacking American families in need. And this bill that's coming up today, H.R. 3567, is really a distasteful and misleading bill that tries to make it seem like every low-income family is somehow a criminal. Nothing could be further from the truth. Very few people want to qualify for welfare. They don't want to be distressed enough to meet these qualifications. This is the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families Act, which is being uh, attacked today. That's what it's called today, uh, actually, it's called TANF. TANF recipients are struggling through the most difficult time of their lives, and they want nothing more than a good job to support their families. This bill that's coming up again today is really a sad attempt to recreate the Ronald Reagan era about the Cadillac driving welfare queen. It wasn't true then, nor is it true today. TANF benefits did not pay for Cadillacs to fund lavish lifestyles. Mr. Speaker, as a single young mother who once relied on food stamps and public assistance 
during a very difficult period. I am really appalled to see Republican politicians attack these families just because they are facing hard times and need a helping hand. TANF benefits keep children in homes and in schools. They keep American families from suffering abject poverty. What we should be doing is help these families by creating jobs, by removing these obstacles and barriers, and we should be helping them to reignite the American dream, not insulting them, which is what this bill does. This Congress should be working together to create more opportunity for the long-term unemployed and the millions of Americans suffering in poverty. We should at least extend unemployment benefits for the chronically unemployed who have hit the 99-week limit, can't apply anymore because they're ineligible, and we should be voting, for example, for the bill, which Congressman Scott and myself have written to help those looking for a job and who can't find a job. We have to remember now that only, uh, there's only one job for every four individuals looking for a job. But unfortunately, instead of working together to make economic justice a reality for every American, this Republican Tea Party will waste another year without a jobs bill, without extending any help to the millions of Americans in need, and without helping Americans retirees. So we should be putting uh, our nation before our party. Americans can't wait, and neither should this Congress. Amen. Thank you, and I yield the balance of my time. The gentlewoman yields back. Pursuant to Clause 12A of Rule 1, the chair declares the House in recess until noon today. The House taking a break until noon Eastern when they'll begin legislative work on the agenda, extending the pay freeze on federal worker salaries and a measure to reduce the budget.